Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. So we've gathered a panel of psychologists at CQU to talk about forensic psychology and where it may be heading and also the utility of the profession. So we thought we'd do this for our final lecture. Now we might just go around and get each person to introduce themselves and just give a little bit of information about their psychology background. So we might start with Paul. Okay, I'm a critical community psychologist and work in the mental health field and the disability field. And um, I've only largely become familiar with forensic psychology since meeting you, Nathan, and you, Rebecca. So thanks for that. Thank you. All right. We might go to Naomi. Hi, so I'm Naomi Ralph. Uh, I'm head of course and senior lecturer in trauma and recovery. And my background area is in trauma. So PTSD, complex trauma, uh, and all the different things there and in between. Uh, and working with a broad, in research, um, predominantly with a broad range of populations from communities affected by disaster to Australian Defence Force uh, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Thank you. And Emma. Hi, everyone. I am a critical psychologist and I'm currently working as a senior lecturer in criminology um, at CQU, so I've moved over to the dark side. Most of my research can be encapsulated through the lens of deviancy. Uh, so I've done some work around gender and sexual subcultures. Um, that tends to be where my research focuses. Thank you. And lastly, Rebecca, who's another budding forensic person. Hi, um, yeah, Rebecca, I'm the unit coordinator and lecturer for Social Foundations of Psychology, first year unit, and currently studying a PhD in forensic psychology with a focus on lie detection. Thanks, Rebecca. So I, I guess everyone in many ways, although you're not necessarily specialising in forensic psychology, there's certainly an overlap between each of your areas. So we've got Emma with criminology and, and deviance and Paul with the community side of things and the mental health aspect, particularly, you know, things such as how crime shapes the community or influences the community. And of course, Naomi as well with trauma, which is often something that's very common amongst, amongst offenders and particularly a, a big thing that's a treatment factor for many offenders that can date back to their childhoods and manifest in their offending behaviour as they get older. And, and as Rebecca was saying, yes, we, we, and we spoke about in an earlier lecture this year, we were looking at lie detection and deception, which is a big factor for engaging and assessing offenders. So what we will, what the plan today was just to run through some questions and get our experts' opinions from our different areas of psychology in terms of how they see forensic psychology and where it may be heading. And so I thought the first question that we would touch on would be, how do you see the role of a forensic psychologist? And where do you see that forensic psychology fits alongside the other forms or practices of psychology? Shall I go first? Yeah. Okay. So for me, I think psychology has a kind of hierarchy um, and I think forensic psychology is up there towards the kind of top end along with clinical psych, I, I suppose. And then I think there's a bit of a, a hierarchy down uh, from there. And obviously forensic psych is the intersection of psychology and the law um, and the criminal justice system, particularly in response to um, mental illness and criminal responsibility but I guess it's the one that's considered sexiest it's the one that's considered to be the most glamorous the most Hollywood and obviously you've got all of these um, TV shows criminal minds 
you know that's the kind of first one that everyone thinks of mind hunter um so i guess it's the one that a lot of students are really interested in because it is that one that's most widely known among the public but what the public know is not necessarily an accurate reflection of what forensic psychology actually is and what forensic psychologists do mm, yeah absolutely anyone else got some views I'd agree with Emma on on that in terms of the it's it's the part of psychology that's got the appeal you know the the esteem to it it's kind of like with clinical psychology works with the mad people forensic psychology is the equivalent who works with the bad people I'm interested in that intersection between um the law and psychology because I know that psychology as a field has had to really fight to be um, recognized as a hard science and you know many many decades have been spent establishing that which is why we have the evidence base that we do and why we encourage working to be evidence based with that intersection with um, with the law and legal process how is it a, is it an equal transaction or is it an equal intersection when you say equal in what aspect are, are you referring to Naomi um, so it does criminology have to um, does criminology have to you know advocate for itself does forensics have to advocate for itself to be heard um, in in legal process so or is it that it, the forensics um, it's taken into account um, but the you know legal process and law will override in the end I, I think it's a my sort of view of it probably is it's a combination of both I think that there's certainly many times where it's a needed part of the law and there's, there's probably that role where it is accepted and it's required but then there's probably also aspects where it can be a bit of an X factor as well for defence attorneys, but not so much in Australia, but particularly overseas, it's a bit of an X factor where you can bring in an expert and you might be able to try and either explain mitigating factors for why someone has committed a crime and that could, you know, psychological factors therefore, you know, reduce their level of criminal responsibility. So in that respect, I think it there's parts where, you know, psych, psychologists want to be advocating for the use of the practice in legal settings but then other times as well it, it you know it's nearly mandated practice so probably the big one here um, in Australia or also more so Queensland is we have what what are known as the dangerous sex offenders act which is the DPSOA act for example and really as part of that there's there's a mandate that they are assessed by either psychiatrists or psychologists for those reports before they can be subject to be released. And, and the release side of that is that it's basically a 15 year type of order where they're, they're under heavy corrective services conditions, they're GPS tracked. So there's certainly a role where it's, it's, it's embedded into some legislation, but then there's also the other side where it can kind of be what we might say maybe manipulated or you know, used to the advantage of whether it's the prosecution or defence at times as well. And I think the the only other thing I thought I might touch on is, yeah, is what Emma and Paul were saying is probably what forensic psychology is most renowned for are actually, yes, the things in the TV shows, which are probably the things that are more likely to create doubt about the credibility of the discipline. So as much as it's fascinating, and compelling to watch in TV shows is often those, you know, poor practices or things that, you know, the intuition or the, the clever interrogation tactics that are more likely to bring the discipline into question because it gets, it's more about the individual in the TV show rather than about the scientific practice and the processes that are being used. And I think that's an important thing that needs to be distinguished is yes there's aspects of it that probably you know, had that sex appeal to it but it's certainly not crafted like it is in the in the tv shows it's much more it's got to be much more 
stringent and stricter processes so that it does have some form of scientific or some form of consistent practice to it. Not sure. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. This is, I think this feeds into what Naomi was saying about, you know, essentially does the law trump forensics, you know, like I think forensic, and I think you're an exception and a good exception. And thank God you working in the field because I think you work in a much better way than I see a lot of forensics working, which is they work within the law. You know, their job is to make the criminal justice system work more efficiently. But in doing that, they don't question the law and whether laws are fair and just. So it, it's about making the system work. And I think there's been a focus on, so I think generally in psychology, we've been a bit anxious about people not thinking we're a proper science. And that's turned our attention to getting things technically right, rather and taken our attention off of issues around morality. So I think forensic psychologists try to get the system to work technically proficient and to be a good system in a technical sense, but it doesn't have that model compass that you would associate with people like you who work in forensic, but not in that hardcore center, but you'd more associate with criminology, I think, the people who would question the fairness of the law and the fairness of the criminal justice system on moral terms. Yeah, I think that's a, that is a good point. And ultimately when it is in that legal setting, generally it is the law that will govern where it will go to. It, it sort of often will stop and start with magistrates or you know, presiding judges. So that that is definitely a challenge. And I think one interesting aspect and you know, Rebecca's probably looked at some of these things with with her research around deception and things along those lines is, you know, understanding processes as well of judges and jurors and those types of things, which if we don't understand those better and really advocate for better practice, then there can be real issues. So we have, you know, judges that are making, you know, biased decisions based on how the, how the perpetrator or the the suspect appears in the similar sort of processes go for jurors, jurors as well, or even eyewitness testimony. So there's so many dual roles and it is operating within the realms, but then as well, it's making sure that you're educating and upskilling the, the practice of some of those individuals. That's the issue for me. I think, I think the system that forensic psychologists work within and the constraints that they work within that system is is a broken system so I think um, most forensic psychologists want to do good and they want to help the people that they're working with and they want to help their clients but often forensic psychology doesn't work at its best because of the system that it has to work within if that system's broken there's there's not a lot else that can be done mm. I also think it's a useful thing to, this is a bit of hyperbole, but it, what's happening in the US at the minute where the, the citizenry are citizenry, uh, kind of opposed to the criminal justice system. Like if in a polarized situation like that, where forensic psychologists had to choose a side, which side would they choose? You know, they would choose the side of the criminal justice system. They wouldn't choose the side of Black Lives Matter, for example. And in that sort of polarized situation, you could see whose interests they would be serving first and foremost. And, that, and that's, again, I don't, that your work isn't reflective of that, but I think a majority of the forensic psychologist's work is. And I think that's, it, 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 and I guess in many ways, and it's probably interesting to, to reflect back to you all, I think that's a challenge maybe many psychologists across different disciplines face now is that we have overarching organizations and governing bodies which very heavily stipulate how the, how practice processes should be and you know many people even at the clinic clinical psychology level are forced to sort of practice within within the scope of what that what those sort of 
boundaries are and you know i guess one of them would be you know clinical psychologists generally probably you wouldn't expect to be delving into forensic work that's probably something that's i guess a practice limitation although some still do but yes and and even if you go and work for an organization in a role as a psychologist your role again will be shaped by that and i think that's an interesting challenge for psychology and where does that fit across the all, all disciplines really come on, rebecca stand up for forensic you've got all the non-forensics jumping in with their opinions here and you you i'm biting my tongue um i think forensics has been oversold via the media and people who have sold it who've known that it's not as scientific uh, a lot of forensic science is not as scientific and it hasn't been questioned and i think uh, we suffer from the same problem that all psychs do it's that idea that you can read someone's mind and look into their soul and and the, the TV shows about, you know, these people, someone does something and people turn up and on a plane and then they make a few phone calls and put the information into a computer the size of a building and it spits out the person's name and where they live. I think that's a real problem. But we've also had forensic scientists who've, who've sold their stuff and they're making people think. If you've got someone from Harvard who's selling their stuff and saying this 100%, it makes it difficult for the other people in the field that say, oh, actually, no, it's not. So I don't, you know, I don't, Nathan's the only forensic, practising forensic psychologist that I know, and, and he's awesome and very moral. So I would, 100% of the forensic psychs I know are very moral. So... Um, but it, it's not sexy to go against your own discipline and say, hey, you know, and it's probably, I don't know um, how publishable it is, but I know that people who have stood up against this sort of um, discipline a little bit have got a, a, a bit of kickback. So a lot of people don't understand what psychology is in general. So I think we suffer from that. And I don't know how you feel, Nathan, but... I'd feel nervous getting up to to testify on something. I'd feel like I'd have to say, hang on a minute, you know, and explain science and explain on average that, you know, it's a fascinating field and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So, yeah, I um, it's got its ups and downs. But I, I was very disappointed when I first started to find out how much is is wrong and possibly dangerous and we need to work against the CSI effect if you've got a jury in front of you because I think if you have someone stands up and says this is Dr so-and-so and he or she is a practicing forensic psychologist and they say that this person is or is not responsible without having the whole understanding of research um, I don't know, the whole thing makes me a bit nervous and there's a lot of things wrong with it. But I think it's an extremely important area where we need more people. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of up and down. It's very valuable, but it's not as precise as people think. And I think we need to explain that to people. But I'm only very early in the journey and Nathan's the expert in it. I think you're. I think that you're right by the expectation about psychology. I think sometimes we don't we don't rise to the challenge very well. You know, our best tools, our best empirical tools in terms of those positivist, quantifiable things, produces a predictive validity of about fifty fifty. You know, that's our best. That's IQ. It's about a fifty fifty. You know, which is the equivalent to saying psychologists. Best thing psychologists can offer is a coin flip. You know that's essentially where where we're at because human behavior is so complex that we don't have them and will never have the science that will be able to give it a sort of predictive validity that people would expect and particular in situations 
which are kind of sometimes life and death situations in the criminal justice system. And um, I think it's a real problem for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, the points you're highlighting are probably feed into my next questions, questions, or I should say, so in terms of the best aspects, but also the, the problematic sides and the costs of things going wrong, what are the implications of things going wrong? And as you're saying, I think there's a definitely a role, even though you're operating within a system that we could arguably say is broken, there's certainly a role, I think, to try and get a broken system to function as best as possible, even with it being broken. And then there's the other side of advocating for the system to correct itself, if that is possible. And I mean, I think that's that's a big challenge that you know probably ex exists across multiple sectors. But there's that side of it, which I think is certainly a positive side in terms of trying to improve those sides and maybe see the system um, amended or adjusted in time. The other side is some of the other aspects that you're talking about with what happens when we get it wrong and what are the costs of overestimating our abilities and claiming things that are not foolproof. And when we're talking about behavioral science, it's, it's not something that we talk about in terms of absolutes. Conclusions are never a, a black and white outcome or very, very rarely. So they're always, we're generally talking about probabilities and likelihoods rather than certainties. And I guess in many ways, we might look back at this time in, you know, 50 years and 50 years down the track. And as we probably do now, when we look back at previous periods of psychology, where we are horrified by some of the practices that have been used. And we think we have advanced from say the Freudian, Freudian days, but really we've only come, you know, so far and where there's still sort of many gaps that we, we don't know. And one of them is, you know, the area of, as we're getting more into neuropsychological testing, I think it's, it's an area at the moment that it's fascinating, but, you know, I think people that are making claims around that also are treading a very dangerous, dangerous line as well, because that's not a foolproof science. And it's probably amongst, you know, one of the aspects of psychology that's got many challenges in terms of, are we ever going to get it to a foolproof science? Will there be a stage where you can scan a brain and you can reliably know that that's the outcome. And I think, you know, even if we look at things from, from a trauma perspective, it can be that trauma has caused, you know, a certain underactivity in the brain, or it could be that it's from other factors. It, you know, it could be just environmental upbringing that's shaped that. It could be, as we say, there's, you know, there's arguments that some personality disorders are prone to just having under under activity in certain areas of the brain um, and that's sort of an argument that it's maybe biological and genetic oriented rather than environmental so there's so many confusions around yes we can suddenly pick these things through neurological testing and those types of practices but then do we actually know what the cause of it is and even if we can identify the cause does that tell us something about that individual or does it just tell us that that isolated error in the brain is underactive, but can we make broader conclusions from that? So even though there's all these advances happening, it raises many, many more questions, I think, than it does answers. And, and Rebecca certainly looked at that and probably has a bit more knowledge around it than I do. Uh, yeah, I think neuro law is the future, but yeah, we're going to have a chicken and egg problem because, I mean, it's already been tried to brain scan, uh, presented to the court uh, with this disgusting child murderer. And um, because his brain scan was 26 years after his crime, it was, they said, well, has that happened? Because, you know, um, Kent Keel has brain scanned thousands of psychopaths in the US and their brains are different. So, but the problem is, you know, you, your brain changes from abuse and, and neglect as well. So you, and there could be, you know, 
And, and if you're brain scanning someone decades when they've been in prison, their brains probably change from being in prison as well. So, and it gets this bit of a minority report thing because, you know, what do we do? Do we do we start brain scanning people? And if they've got these, you know, smaller prefrontal cortex, do we lock them up? Because they're more likely to, you know, to maybe do some damage. But I think neuro law will be the future. It's been going for some time. Stanford University's had their fMRI since 2000. So... And there's a lot of talk around it and it is, I love it. I think it's fascinating. I think it takes us more into a scientific realm, um, you know, when, and, and because it's fascinating how all these psychopaths that remember they're the ones in prison, they've got different brains. Their prefrontal cortex is smaller and or underactive. So there's something going on. And as you know, Nathan, um, they're, they're very dangerous people, psychopaths. So the sooner we can identify them, the better. And children with conduct disorder have been shown the same. So, you know, I think that's where it will go. But what we do with it is what will frighten people. And then you've got a right to silence and everything as well. So it's, yeah, I really think that's the way it's going to go. And there's great things about it. But, geez, it's going to cause some dilemmas. But it's a fascinating feel, I think. Wouldn't it become another tool? So you have a range of assessments. You also have this tool that can be used. It won't be definitive because of the issue of, well, when did the damage occur? That it, it can't be completely causative, but it's another tool that can be used to understand the situation. Well, another thing too, I've read that conduct disorder, low resting heart rate is diagnostic. So we could... Yeah, I know, look at Emma, she's like, oh. Um, but you look at kids and that and low resting heart rate if they've done something. And I mean, it's a precursor, you know, to a diagnosis of psychopathy. And it is, it's a scary thing, but you look at it and when you read the stories about psychopaths and everything, and, and Nathan, I'm sure you've um, known a few in your travels, they're so dangerous. And, you know, therapy can make them worse because it teaches them how to behave. So, oh, Paul's jumping at the bit. I'm torn between this because I think psychopaths and that they, you know, really dangerous people, and, you know, these horrendous pedophiles and that, I'm, I'm torn because you want to find them and keep them locked up for good because so often you'll, you know, you see and then they get out and they do it again. Psychopaths are more likely to be paroled because they're just, you know, a lot of them are good at convincing you. So I'm torn. I'm torn with that because you want these people out of society for good. But, yeah, I don't know. What do you, what do you think, Nathan? What do you think? Emma and Paul's dying to say something. Let's go to Paul. <laughs> to the people who are watching this video, this is, what Rebecca's doing here is bear baiting when it, the two critical psychs in the room you know what you're doing i mean it, it's the switcheroo this is what psychology has been doing for so long in terms of mental illness they've been doing this you know you switch the signs for the symptoms and the causes for the effects so it'd be like you go to your physician and they say say that oh you've got lung cancer which is causing you to smoke you know that that's effectively what we're doing here and I think that the risk of psychology doing that switch is enormous, given what we've been discussing, which is psychology is desperately trying to show itself as a predictive science that has some sort of value. And it'll do this switch if it thinks that it can get that sense of value, you know, switch the objective thing for the subject of you know, the subjective thing, switch it around for the objective thing, and then we can we can say we're a proper science and we can predict stuff. Emma? <laughs> yeah, I'm completely with you on that, Paul. Like, I probably couldn't uh, put it any better than, than you have. And it just makes me feel really uncomfortable when we're talking about using brain scans to determine these things about people. And obviously not all psychopaths are, are dangerous. They, they don't all commit crime. They don't all become criminal. Um, and I just worry where that will end, you know, if if that makes sense. 
this is Rebecca saying this minority report, isn't it? It, it, it? It's the pathway into fascism, which I know Rebecca, you know, can see. And I think that's the dilemma, isn't it? Knowing that these tools, like as Naomi saying, once, you know, these tools are not inert. You know, you develop these tools, you convince people that these tools work and someone will grab them. The nasty guys will grab them. You know, the corporate psychopaths that, that Nathan knows will grab them and use them to cause harm. That's the worry. What would you guys do though? So you've got a brain scan and you say, okay, the parole board wants to let this guy out. Um, yeah, it can be a woman, but it's usually a guy. They want to let them out. They committed a horrendous crime. So they murdered a child like this other guy did, murdered multiple children. And we've got a brain scan that indicates that this man is a psychopath, The you know, and the statistics show us that this person could likely do it again. Do you want the brain scan or do you want to, this is where I feel you sort of have to go, okay, he's got a human right to have another chance or do you want to look at at the brain scan and say okay well this is you know this is what it shows he's likely going to continue this violent offending which way do you want to go i'll throw the brain scan out and i'll tell the person that they don't want to talk to a psychologist they need to talk to a priest that that's the kind of moral decision that they're after the, you know, someone who can offer redemption or something. I don't know. I think they'll be talking to the wrong person using the wrong type of evidence. I wouldn't be that extreme. I want to see a suite of, of, of pieces of information. So I would dread decisions being made on the basis of a brain scan alone. But, you know, I can see that it, it could contribute a piece of understanding to, to make a rational decision, I think. But it can't be the only tool. It has to be a part of a, a range of tools or, you know, a range of pieces of evidence. Um, yeah. Yeah, I definitely think we need to look at more than just one factor. So I wouldn't want to just look at one brain scan and, and say yes, no. Um, and I think we also need to consider the role of the criminal justice system as well. I mean, that's a a broken system that's a system that fails I'd want to know what support would be available to that person if they did get out um you know how would that look how effective would that be so for, for me it's about trying to gauge all of the information and also this is the the tricky bit isn't it it's that likelihood so this scan tells me somebody is likely to do something but what's that really telling me then? And that's where I think that's what makes me feel really uncomfortable. Obviously, if there was, you know, a 90% chance that somebody would um, offend again, then you're playing with a different deck of cards than if there's just a likelihood. And that's what makes me uncomfortable about all of this. If a child's got a, re a low resting heart rate, what's the, what's the real, what's the, there's a likelihood, but what's that really saying? You know, that's, that's, it feels a bit sinister, I think. I, I think I've read, or oh, Nathan, you'd be able to correct me, that psychopaths are three times as likely to commit crimes again as non-psychopaths who are let out from prison. Uh, deaths of police in the US, it was 40 something percent are committed by psychopaths. So it's been a while since I read all that, but yeah, I was really, yeah, there's something about the brain scans that I, I think it takes it, it it's still theorising, but it's not as much as we have theorised in the past. And if you're consistently getting the same thing, it's like the Phineas Gage, you know, how much he changed with that brain damage and they're consistently showing this over thousands of brain scans and they've put out lie detection methods brain scanning based on four studies you know with a few people yet yet this is thousands of incarcerated people and it's consistently showing the same thing and it makes sense because your prefrontal cortex where you're making your decisions and yeah I just 
I just think, I think psychopaths need to be distinguished from other criminals and watched a lot more closely because they are statistically much more likely to be released and to um, commit crimes again. So, yeah. So I've shown my hand there, Paul, haven't I? I better be quiet now and just nod. I mean, I think I, I really like Naomi's point around the role of that in assessment, which is that, and generally we'd probably say that a best practice approach would be to use multiple processes of assessment rather than relying on a, on a single source. So I think, yes, you could, you could use a, things from an interview to, you know, your risk assessment measures to neuroside testing. I mean, all of it is going to arguably give you a, a better picture rather than hopefully create more confusion. And I think if it was in an ideal world, maybe in terms of we had our prison set up like they do say in Scandinavia, then my view would be that the brain scan would essentially offer greater insights into what your hypothesis might be about the person. So if, for example, you think that they're a psychopath and you can test certain aspects through doing neuropsych testing, you might find that, yes, the amygdala isn't functioning or it's under, underactive. And I think the, the positive of that aspect is that if you had the time and the right environment in a prison setting, you would potentially look at, and, and we've seen things in, you know, in terms of Norman Deutsch's book around the brain that, I think the brain that rewires itself or the brain that changes, but there, we can certainly do largely behavioural based approaches and interventions that we can see that we do get changes in the brain. And I think that would be very interesting to be able to target aspects where we know that there might be empathy deficits, for example, and look at whether that we do get changes in the brain, in the brain structure or the activation of an area such as the amygdala through, it would probably need to be three, four years worth of behavioural based intervention in the right therapeutic type of environment, which they do have in Scandinavian prisons are much more therapeutic rather than um, sanctionary like our, our prisons are. But I think that's the function is to identify what areas of the brain really are either traumatised or underactive or, or not working for whatever variety of reasons. And do we see that that functional capacity starts to change through intervention rather than it being used as a solely diagnostic tool i think it's got greater therapeutic impact so that we can understand more so what's going on for the person and then we have a better idea around our decision to release them from custody because we can actually track or see that there's been changes but that's probably my view around how it all fits at the moment but no doubt it, it, it will likely change with whatever new technologies or however they use them, we might find that, yeah, some dodgy practices do creep in though. We definitely need to do this. We, we When you look at neuroplasticity, we should be, um, you know, looking at children. We should be looking at children who are starting in their system because that is the best time. And yeah, neuroplasticity research shows you can change the brain. And the younger that you, um, you know, you can help someone, obviously the better. So we should definitely be targeted at those behavioural interventions and treatment, not just locking up these kids, sort of identifying and really, it shouldn't, I, I really believe it should be about, we should spend the money on intense treatment and helping kids in terrible situations because that will change their brain. I think the one thing that could help, I mean, the one hope I think there is for psychology and forensic psychology might actually be in neuropsychology if we abandon our scientific model. You know, what you find is the brain's more complicated than the universe. And, you know, when people who are trying to engage with theoretical physics have abandoned the scientific paradigm we're stuck in, which is this nature nurture thing. You know, they've gone to a much more dialectical scientific model, which is about complexity deep complexity and it makes a nonsense to talk about is it the environment or is it the person it's the interaction that the clue is it's in that interaction and we've adhered to this scientific model that would just be completely inappropriate and is completely inappropriate for any serious neuroscience and i think there's an interesting area here 
that I know Naomi knows about, which is indigenous knowledge systems, is giving us, us a push if we take it in the right direction to understand that we are intimately bound to our environment and you cannot pull us apart from it in a way that would help us understand who we are. I think that's a great analogy, Paul. I really appreciate it. And yes, the, that connectedness, the complexity and how it relates to the interconnection um, between, between everything. I think that's at the forefront of it all. Yeah, and I, if we get to the bottom of criminal behavior and even personalities, disorders, for example, it is how that individual, first of all, perceives themselves and relates to themselves, but also how they, the individual, interact and relate to the environment. And I, and I think it is, we're talking about largely, even going back to Freudian days, but, you know, relational issues. And it's, it's that interaction, as Paul's saying, between the individual and the environment and the distorted feedback processes and things that develop through certain events, either in, in childhood or, um, you know, I guess, setbacks and challenges or even traumas. And it, it does, it, it, it then creates patterns and pathways that do get established in the brain, but also you know, cognitively and behaviorally, they then become very much in, you know, intertwined and um, they then do, they become their, they determine their way of functioning. And, and I think that is, can you, can you modify those? Can you reverse those? Can you change how the person perceives themselves and how they perceive others and that, that interaction loop? And that's probably, I, I tend to be a, more so a proponent of behavioral approaches because I think the modifying the behavior that is a really effective way of changing that interaction cycle and particularly you know for offenders because we're often talking about their actions and how their actions have an impact on others and I think behavioral approaches are very effective at least it gets us you know going back to something that as basic as you know the act as if the change has happened um, and looking at behavioural practices that way. And I think then if you can try and correct the behaviour, then I view that the cognitive learning often will come and follow that. But yes, it is all very much relational and it's that interaction between the individual and the environment. And we're talking about, often just talking about extremes of that when it comes to criminal behaviour and these ruptures in that healthy pathways to develop between the individual and the environment. We might bring things to an end. Is there anything though that anyone wanted to add as sort of final remarks? I used to think forensic psychologists were the seed of the Satan, but since working with you, Nathan and Rebecca, very much changed my mind. There's hope. All right. Well, did you have something, Naomi? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say it's been a, an interesting conversation. Thank you. I, I, I've enjoyed it and have um, got some things to ponder on and have learned some things too. So thank you for leading it so, so capably. Well, thank you, everyone, for your input. I think it's, it's a important and healthy thing for any discipline or area to get an understanding about, first of all, where it fits in the realm of psychology, but also the different perceptions and views that others have around, you know, the, even the strengths, but also the weaknesses and the challenges that may be there for the discipline, because really you can't progress and change without looking at the different views. And if you only focus on your own views and your own little view of the world, then that can be, challenging like we're talking about with our offenders so thanks everyone for your time and your input and hopefully it's helpful for the students thanks nathan